Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tuesday Night Rheumatology, PSA all the way. It's our last Tuesday Night Rheumatology devoted to psoriatic arthritis. And this week, we're going to do Journal Club. Uh, you can see the journal articles that we have here. I think we're going to have a great discussion, much like we did two weeks ago uh, in our first Journal Club. I want to uh, let all of you know that this whole month uh, of PSA All The Way has been sponsored by Janssen. Uh, many thanks to them. Uh, they had no input into the content, but they were fully behind what we were doing and trying to spread the word on psoriatic arthritis, the challenges, the successes, the things that we're still looking forward to. Uh, I hope that you've enjoyed this past month. I want to ask my faculty to um, join um, by turning on their cams and whatnot. And uh, we'll start with uh, some introductions. Gents, how are you? Very good. Uh, Artie Kavanaugh uh, at uh, University of California, San Diego. Here, let me, let me uh, show you. Okay, here yeah, is that is is that better? That's that's uh, you're, you're, you're that's trying down to the block a little bit. Uh, yeah, I don't think you're going to be able to compete with uh, David Liu. David. Well, I'm here. This is what's outside my window, so I won't I won't say exactly where I am, but I'm on holiday. David Liu, rheumatologist and clinical pharmacologist from Melbourne, Australia, and um, had the pleasure of uh, working with Jack on Room now for multiple conferences now for multiple years and I'm pretty excited about PSA all the way, especially since I had a little bit to do with coming up with a name. That's my little claim to fame here. There you go. There you go. <laughs> we may very well just abandon the journal club and just play where, where in the world is David Liu. Um, that might be the better <laughs> game. Eric. Eric Ruderman. I'm at uh, Northwestern in Chicago where it's a bit colder than uh, where either the other two gents are um, and excited to participate. Yeah. All right, so the ground rules. Um, first off, everybody tell, turn off your cell phones. You know where the bathroom is. Um, I um, want to remind everyone that we want your questions. We're, if you saw the, the journal club we did two weeks ago, it was lively. We peppered our um, expert um, PSA uh, faculty with a lot of questions, both from the audience and from the presenters. David and I are going to present the, the two articles today that we're going to discuss. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A um, uh, box, not the chat box. Um, use the chat to say hello to Artie, but otherwise uh, the Q&A to, uh, to question Artie and Eric um, or any of us for that matter. So um, with that being said, I'm going to go back to um, sharing the screen and uh, we're going to get started uh, as David is going to present for us the very first journal article we have. Great. So I, I'm pretty excited to talk about this paper because it's very different to what we normally do. But there's a space which has been evolving pretty rapidly over the last, say, 10 years. I think there was a point where fecal microbiota transplantation, and I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but I'm, so I'm going to call it FMT from now on. But FMT was a bit of a voodoo science, really, in that it seemed a uh, this kind of magical thing where you took someone's uh, microbiota uh, harvested from a donor and that you implanted it into another person and then magical things might happen. I think it's really only since uh, 2012 when we saw in the New England Journal of Medicine evidence for um, FMT in, <coughs> excuse me, in refractory C. diff that we started to believe that this might actually be clostridium difficile infection, that we decided that this might actually be something that might actually work in real life for some people. And so we've seen this evolution over time. We've seen our IBD colleagues uh, have a look at, at what this looks like and see improvements uh, in different IBD states using FMT. We've seen uh, well, a benefit in now primary C. diff rather than refractory C. diff. And then we've started to see things with perhaps a little bit more systemic um, benefit. Things for, uh, there's even been some early uh, work done in immune checkpoint inhibitor response, uh, looking at small numbers, obviously, but patients who didn't, weren't responding to PD-1 inhibitor therapy um, to, for cancer 
subsequently um, improving. So with that, of course, there's been this cottage industry of FMT, um, people doing it all sorts of different ways. There have been safety concerns, and in fact, um, had two deaths um, in the United States. Uh, now, thankfully, there's better regulation We've gone from a world where we just used to put down an, uh, a nasal vaginal uh, tube and put it down there. Um, we've gone down now to endoscopic placement. So things are getting a little bit more exacting. <clears throat> and that's the background in which we, we see this study here uh, entitled Safety and Efficacy of FMT for Active Peripheral Psoriatic Arthritis, an Exploratory Randomised Placebo Controlled Trial. And it comes from colleagues in a dense in, uh, in Denmark, uh, in southern Denmark. Um, and they, from 2015 onwards, started to do this single centre study, proof of concept study, looking at FMT in psoriatic arthritis and peripheral psoriatic arthritis. It um, ended up being um, looking at a double blind randomised placebo control uh, trial for psoriatic arthritis patients. Um, and uh, looking, trying to prove super on methotrexate and then trying to prove superiority over that, over a sham FMT. Uh, so what was the intervention? Well, we looked at gastroscopic guided FMT. So all patients had a gastroscopy, getting down into the duodenum, uh, placing the FMT there and um, or a sham. Uh, even They even got food colouring out to try and get the colouring right into the duodenum to see whether there'd be any benefit. There we go to the next slide. So um, I'm just going to detail out a bit of uh, the structure here, and I'd, I'd love to throw it to the um, the group for some comment. The primary endpoint here, and I guess this is an investigator initiated trial, uh, proof of concept. But what they looked at there was a percentage of patients with treatment failure, so needing treatment intensification over those 26 weeks. And so that was really a decision made um, combined with the clinician and the patient. So uh, that's certainly uh, something which is a little bit broader. They did look at in the secondary endpoints, uh, primarily at HACDI and ACI20, things we're a little bit more familiar with at, at week 20. But then there was an exploratory analysis looking over multiple more conventional psoriatic arthritis endpoints. And so in this study, they enrolled um, adults, uh, patients with active peripheral psoriatic arthritis, so three or more swollen joints, and who had that despite ongoing treatment with methotrexate um, for over three months at 15 milligrams a week or more. And interestingly, in, in this cohort, there's, well, in this study, there was a, which reflects a little bit of, of practice in Denmark, there's a lot of subcutaneous methotrexate use. Um, all of those patients remained on methotrexate, but if they had other drugs, other non-methotrexate DMARDs, those were washed out. So conventional synthetic DMARDs, um, 12 weeks off, biologic DMARDs, 26 weeks off. They're not big percentages on those drugs um, in addition to methotrexate, so 23% for conventional synthetic DMARDs, 16% for biologics, but still uh, non-negligible there. Um, patients with IBD, cancer, severe chronic infection, and celiac disease were excluded. But perhaps really the um, critical bit here, and this study was uh, started enrolling in 2015, and in 2019 they started to curtail things because uh, they realised that their grant funding was about to run out. And, of course, then something, something happened in 2020, and I'm not sure what that was, see something, not sure what happened there. But that really kind of gave the death knell to the, end, to the recruitment for this study. But out of the 97 patients they screened, only 31 were actually ended up being randomised. So we've really got small numbers here. And in fact, you can see there on that flow diagram how those patients washed out with, uh, in the end, uh, 15 in the FMT arm and 16 in the sham arm. So I'm, I'm wondering, maybe I can throw to the group at this point what people think about this in terms of a proof of concept. Is this enough? Um, is there, are there fallibilities here that really prevent us thinking too much further about this? Well, as you said, uh, uh, David, that's a nice review. Um, we we're so used to looking at the peripheral arthritis endpoints, the, the ACR20, the, the DAPSA, the whatever. Um, but in the clinic, you say our patients, in, are, are they getting worse because you need to do more? So um, knowing the, what they found, I think that's perfectly fair and perfectly reasonable for an investigated initiated study. Uh, there was a question in the Q&A about wanting the duodenum instead of the bowel. And I, I think you, you sort of addressed that, that you... you 
there's certain ways to do it. Um, if you put it in the stomach, it's always, you know, is that far enough? So I think the duodenum was a reasonable compromise to something that's going to be a little bit more invasive and also introduce a little bit more heterogeneity. But I think it was, you know, a very uh, reasonably designed study. And the outcome is, uh, you know, it's, it, the study is blinded. So there's not a bias, if you will, about accelerating treatment in people. Do you think we would have had, um, uh, uh, um, Eric, a, um, a supposition of a better response based on what they've seen in, in the GI trials, both for infection and then for IBD? No, I, I think that's my concern is that, the, you know, I'm not so sure that they had a, a basis to go with something like this. I mean, the, you know, the speculation in the GI trials, we sort of know that there's, you know, in C. diff, there's dysregulated you know, microbiota in the, in the gut and, and you try to get it back to normal and that suppresses the C. diff, which is overgrowing. And that kind of makes a lot of sense. The, the rationale for this is in some ways sort of a lot of hand waving. We know that there's some um, dysbiosis going on in the gut in people with BSA or other inflammatory arthritis. But, but beyond that, I don't know that we have any kind of data that suggests that modifying that is likely to make a difference. So this is a pretty bold trial as a proof of concept. The other problem is that they didn't have the right numbers. I mean, you know, they started out, they ended up with 31 patients in the trial. Their goal was 80. And, and even the goal of 80 was based on a, on a power calculation that said that the, the sham people would fail twice as much as the people who got the, 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 um, the, the stool. And, and I, I don't know where that number comes from. They sort of made up that number. So I, I'm not so sure they, even if they had shown benefit or some sense of benefit. I don't know that they had the kind of numbers to actually show that that meant anything. In the end, they didn't. But so I just don't know where we go with that. You got to give them credit, though. I mean, I I, I, mean, I think you do, Eric, as well. Yeah. In our clinic, when you see a psoriatic arthritis patient, I have uh, my colleague, Dr. Monica Guma, who wants to do biomarker studies. So she wants blood samples and maybe skin samples and, you know, sometimes a joint sample. We have a radiologist and they want to do MRIs with the three Tesla ultra short time echo. And when I ask patients to be in those studies, like, you want to do what? And I can't imagine <laughs> going to a patient and saying, um, here's something I want to ask you. Like, you want to do what? <laughs> Haven't they moved in the C. diff studies into, like, those capsules with dehydrated um, stool and not actually, like, real stool put down with a tube, typically? So that, this is a whole other sort of ball of wax, too. It's a pretty big procedure. Yeah, if you if you read the methods on how they give their stuff, shall we say, um, <laughs> that it's um, it's hard to judge it as to whether oh this is legitimate or not. I mean, it just seems like you know someone took notes and they wrote it down, and now this is a standard. But I, I think David it, it intimated that there are probably a lot of different standards for how you deliver FMT. Yeah. So. And I guess that gets to the uh, helps to answer the question that we might get asked by our patients who hear about something on TV, on the internet, um, and there are all these cottage industry FMTs that we have to try and uh, answer the questions about from our from our patients. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right. Let's go. Let's go. I guess go go on to the next one. Okay. Great. So I think we've already um, intimated what the results were, and I think <laughs> that uh, here is here's a couple of my on the left, and I'll I'll try and speak to some stuff that's not on that before we get to that. Uh, so that in terms of the two groups, uh, the, in, after randomization, uh, they were quite comparable, except there were more uh, men in the in the FMT group, and uh, there was shorter disease duration in the FMT group, uncertain what effect that may or may not have had. Um, it, these patients, I think, probably represent what we would see as rheumatologists. 87% um, had had a history of, of personal history of uh, skin psoriasis, um, although really these are patients with a low skin burden. So actually of those patients who did actually have active skin disease, um, those the mean PASI was 1.24 across the two groups. So really um, not the kind of patients that our dermatology colleagues would be driving necessarily. The 26 week uh, Kaplan Meyer, you can see there on the left, the blue line is the sham, the red line is the active treatment, the FMT. Uh, so higher up, that, that graph is obviously better because uh, lower down means that you're flaring more and needing more, um, where we have more treatment failure. 
And there's a big difference between uh, uh, those two lines where the, the sham seems to be doing quite well. And then at 26 weeks, uh, we saw FMT having 60% treatment failure rather than 19% in the sham group. So if you took it, take a crude relative risk on that, um, it gets down to 3.20, it's in the wrong direction. Um, mainly the treatment intervention was starting biologic DMR. Some patients did get intraarticular corticosteroids. Uh, so the mean time to studying biologics obviously reflects what you might see there, 32 uh, days on for the FMT group, 99 days for the sham group. But does, this um, mean, sure. that, 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 does this mean giving the FMT made people worse? I think that's a big question. I, I don't know what Dr. Kavanagh and Dr. Rudman think uh, um, in terms of that, and I, I'd love to discuss that because that's a big difference. That's not just there was no superiority. That, that almost, not that we can make those claims, but it looks like inferiority if we were going to say anything. This isn't a failed study. This is a, a profoundly negative study. I mean, these are patients in the clinic with some disease activity, but not a ton. And even look at, look at three months, how many people who got the active treatment flare that you, you'd, you'd have to like look in your clinic for something bad going on if you had your patients this many of them flare just with the placebo. You just don't see that. Um, the, the placebo would look more like the sham group, I think, where you lose some people over time. Uh, but this is definitely, it looks like something definitely negative happened in the treatment group. You think they had enough people to know that for sure already? I mean, they, you know, there are 15 people in each group. I mean, yeah, I know they've got uh, the the um, p value is is under 0 0.05, but still, I mean, I I just wonder how much of that is really you know real or not. I, I don't know that I would take yeah. that away, but but it it clearly didn't work. I don't. I'm I'm a little uncertain as to whether I'd look at this and say it made them worse. Yeah, I mean, it may not have, but boy, that is that <laughs> yeah, is certainly. Tremendous. I know it's interesting. Yeah. It is. It is certainly. I think they fully expected it to be better or if it wasn't better that the, the curves would sort of overlap each other. And, you know, there's not that many people, but this boy, the sure catches. Well, they, that. they did their power calculations on exactly the opposite that they, <laughs> they thought that there would be twice as many flares in the, in the sham group. And they saw exactly the opposite of what they had predicted when they sort of designed the trial. So maybe it's real. It certainly didn't help. Maybe it made them worse. Maybe they swapped. Somebody swapped the vials. <laughs> Yeah, like that episode on Seinfeld where they, yeah. they uh, never mind. So, <laughs> but but Eric, you know your point on you know the about the design here and the failings in the recruitment was uh, basically questions all the results. But those who did the study and reported yeah. it said we went ahead because we couldn't recruit um, because at, in the least, if this was going to be a home run we'd be able to know, right? Right, Except right. This was a home run in the wrong direction. In the wrong direction, right. Um, so does this so, not say well, that that there's, you know, there's such a thing as gut homeostasis, and that's probably what they were, in fact, disrupting here. Um, and they well, that's not what they ended up concluding. We'll get to the conclusion when David finishes the paper, but, I, you know, I, I, that was not their takeaway in the paper. We'll talk about that. Okay. Great. So this is safety, and maybe we just uh, we won't spend too long on this. But uh, there wasn't much to see here. I think we wouldn't necessarily. These are small numbers, of course. Uh, lots of adverse events in both group, and nothing that led to withdrawal. And mainly gastrointestinal were adverse events. There was one case of diverticulitis that was deemed eventually unrelated to the FMT. Okay. Hey, but they so, did have two. They did have two concerning adverse events that I want to note. I mean, so this is not benign. So they had. They had one subject with uncontrolled defecation. They didn't go into details, but that worries me a bit. And then they had another one who developed an asthma flare after vomiting during the procedure, which also is a little bit icky. <laughs> and so, you know, this is not um, without potential risk and something that, you know, didn't seem to do anything. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think the um, implication between the lines there is about the risk of aspiration pneumonia and, and that yeah. this isn't necessarily an easy, uh, right. even you know, the, an expert centre, they have these kind of difficulties. What kind of, what kind of difficulties would we have out in terms of uh, people starting doing this for the first time? Well, and so it is the first time. It's a, a little bit reminiscent of the vagal nerve stimulation stuff where 
you know, they caused a few Horner syndromes and whatnot as they were learning how to do the procedure. Now they've kind of worked those kinks out. You're not supposed to get that. I'm not saying that that therapy is going forward, but nonetheless, uh, I, I think that there's going to ultimately be better ways of giving um, uh, fecal transplants than, than what, was, what was done here. Great. So these are break down the uh, primary endpoints and then some of the key endpoints. And then next slide, I'll show you the um, other secondary endpoints. <clears throat> so that's treatment failure at the top, and we've discussed that already. And that breaks down uh, to the patients who have had intra-articular glucocorticoids um, and patients um, who uh, had to start uh, DMARDs, not conventional synthetic and biologic. Um, so really, certainly, yeah, those patients studying, bio uh, there were a lot more patients in the FMT group studying biologics. That's what, what we, they went to straight away. Uh, that's obviously of some concern. Uh, the interest in people's thoughts on that. To just break down what the rest of what's on this slide, um, the, the, there was, you know, maybe you'd ask, well, maybe people felt better overall. Maybe there was something else. But the hack DI went uh, in the um, wrong direction as well. The sham patients did quite a bit better um, than the FMT patients. Uh, any comments on this? No, it seems to reflect the rest of it. Um, not, not good at all. And um, if anything, it looked like the sham did better as far as their uh, enthesitis scores. But anyway, these are other outcomes. Uh, and I mean, I want to, ref to just reflect on the fact that these are outcomes at 26 weeks. So this is after you've had uh, a flare, and we saw a lot of those flares in the FMT group, well, a decent number were early. And so these patients have actually started um, therapies which, which we know that work in PSA. And then uh, these are the outcomes after 26 weeks. So they've had a chance. Um, well, there's a bit of regression to the mean there in, in a way, because um, so what we're seeing here, um, we're looking through across those secondary endpoints, um, the kind of things that we'd be used to looking at. I know we talked at the journal, last journal club a lot about DLQI in terms of quality of life, but these patients didn't have much in terms of skin disease anyway, so it's hard to know. What about the ACR 50 and 70? We, we know a bit about those, and, and certainly we're not seeing um, much uh, much there really in the right direction. Uh, patients, uh, you know, the eight patients got ACR 50 in the sham group versus three in the FMT group. And if you go right across the um, patient reported outcomes, look across the VASs, um, and it's, it's not a pretty picture either. Now we're not drawing p-values from this because the um, hierarchical analysis stopped, but uh, certainly if you, if you were, then these are heading in the wrong, um, the wrong direction. You know, my, the interesting takeaway from that table and, and which I thought was kind of interesting was that, you know, their outcome, their primary outcome was change in therapy because the patient had failed. And I think it's interesting to see that all of the PROs kind of went in that direction, um, which A, tells you that the outcome actually seemed to sort of track and it wasn't just sort of, you know, they changed for another reason. But the other thing that's sort of interesting is it tells us that people decide to change therapy based on PROs and not swollen joints and not numbers and not other stuff, which makes sense. And we know that all the time, but I think that was sort of an interesting takeaway from this. That's why they failed was all the PROs that just didn't do well, whether that was because of, you know, the FMT or not, I don't know, but that that's, that was the, they all sort of run consistent. So, I mean, I think there, there's all sorts of questions and I'd love to be able to love to spend a bit of time here discussing perhaps what the future of FMT is based on this, because it's a small study. Uh, it's a pilot study, um, but FMT uh, was not only not superior, uh, was uh, markedly, um, well, I mean, arguably inferior, I probably overstated there a little bit, but the, um, I mean, and the question, I guess, is this was a, at a centre which has a um, an established process for running this. Is the, but does this process actually need to be refined? Are we doing the FMT in the right way to start with? So I wonder whether I can throw um, to the group as to whether there's whether we feel that there's a future in manipulating the microbiome for PSA therapy, and and if so, who should we be looking at? Are there are specific disease subtypes. Should we be measuring uh, dysbiosis in patients and then trying to target those? Who should we be looking to treat with P for, um, which PSA patients should we be looking to treat with microbiome manipulation, if any at all? I mean, uh, yeah, 
Um, I'll take a crack. I mean, I, I, I think we need more information. I think that we need, you know, people like Monica at your place already and Jose Sharon stuff to, to help us understand what specific populations, what to target. This kind of like blunt instrument didn't work, not only didn't work, maybe it made them worse. And, and, you know, their conclusion was that, you know, further larger randomized controlled trials should be done to further explore this. I, I wouldn't do that based on this. I think you need to get a little bit more information about how to target this kind of approach before you broaden this. This to me says, don't go any further until we have some better handle on how to use this kind of approach. Yeah, I, I think, you know, they, and don't we deal with this in the clinic every day? Is the microbiome important? Absolutely. Okay. What do I do about it? Should I eat nothing but yogurt or should I never <laughs> eat yogurt? Right. Uh, we have no idea. There's so much that we don't know. Mm -hmm. This is so, as you said, this is like so, so rudimentary. Uh, it's back decades ago um, when some of us were young and T cells bad, RA, kill T cells. <laughs> it didn't work. Well, now you're like, well, of course it didn't work because you killed all the regulatory T cells. Uh, and that's why IL-2 inhibition failed and CD4 treatment failed, et cetera. So we are so far behind that in the microbiome. Um, it's interesting. I've talked to some GI people. They don't, they're not bothered by this at all. They're like, one transplant does not change your microbiome. You know, a couple of mm. capsules of somebody's poo isn't going to change your microbiome. Although these data would say, I don't, don't know if I would take repeat treatment with some this somebody's poo. <laughs> and then i think the more important thing is they who's poo they're like no <laughs> you don't just give somebody poo and you know they have all these what they call them the super donors and crohn's where i don't know how but they have found that certain people's microbiome is definitely beneficial i think that's also true in c diff all poo is not created equal and that they have people Who's, uh, who are preferred donors, because for whatever their spectrum of microbiota, that's beneficial, whereas somebody else's might not be. They just, they didn't even, I didn't really say how they picked the poo um, on these. And I don't know, we don't know how to pick the poo. So uh, I, I, I don't know that the idea, I mean, the microbiome is certainly important, but this says, you know, you got to understand more before you just go jumping in. And, you know, they spelled, and they spelled fecal wrong, which I think ruined the study from the start. You know, F, it was F E C A L. Um, you know, I, I, like everybody else, was really excited by Jose's work and the work of others. So we're seeing this, this whole microbiome um, slant to research and potential, potentially being mechanistically important going on what now for like, eight years or so. And, um, at least what is it? I mean, and, and it's, and it's abnormal in everything, right? It's abnormal in the mouth. It's abnormal in the gut. It's abnormal in lupus. It's abnormal in, in inflammatory arthritis of many different kinds. And yet there's no evidence that altering it leads to benefit. Does this not sound like vitamin D? It's well, abnormal but, in everything. And but Jack, it, I mean, it's nothing. But it's abnormal. And, and the problem is, I don't know that we understand why it's abnormal in a lot of those folks, right? Because there's so many different pieces it's to it. There's a genetic component to it that people are different. You put, you have two people in the same household. Yes, they're going to share some microbiota because they eat the same and they have the same bugs all over the place, but they're going to be very different if they're genetically different because there's different people, you know, there's different parts to it. So I, I don't think their work is for naught. I just think to, to Artie's point, it's it's not ready for prime time because we don't really understand how to manipulate it at an individual level that's going to make a difference. But vitamin D is asso basically associated with unwellness. Yeah. And and can you not say the same thing here? Again, I, I would I really want to believe in this. I really like the you know the, the 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 pharmacologic data that says that the microbiome is important in how people are going to respond to certain drugs, in, especially in cancer. But again, we're not yet seeing any interventions that have altered this and, um, and led well, to- Well, because it's, it's not so simple, right? In the C. diff story, the problem is you're, you've got overgrowth of C. diff and you don't have enough other normal flora to sort of suppress that. And so you give them enough normal flora and then the C. diff can't overgrow. It's one bug that you figured out that's the problem. There's no single bug here. And until we sort of figure out what, what's the bug or the bugs 
in the specific person that you're trying to treat, I don't know how far you can take this yet. Um, so one, um, uh, Barry McLeod says there, there are other ways to manipulate the microbiome other than with fecal transplant. And so maybe a progressive diet, you know, basically mm -hmm. trying to tailor one's microbiome with a tailored diet, that would be one way. There's not really much good evidence that probiotics or prebiotics or postbiotics, whatever that is, um, actually matters uh, a, a whole much because a whole bunch because those are basically dead bugs that you're giving. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I how many of your patients have have gone on an anti-inflammatory diet, Jack? And how often does that actually work? Um, well, you know. I, again, you're talking to the wrong guy because when I talk about this, I get in trouble. But you know, we did a, a, we actually studied about 200 patients in our clinic um, where they went on a um, um, a gluten free, low carbohydrate diet, and a high percentage of them got better. And it wasn't because of weight loss. Now, was that just a placebo effect? There's no controls here and whatnot. And you're you're giving patients control of their disease by telling them something specific to do with their diet. I think it needs to be studied and the, stu and the studies on diet haven't been all that great, but it only worked in, in PSA and, and spa. It didn't work in other diseases, OA, FM, lupus, or, or RA. We, again, we tried it in over 200 patients. So I do think there's something to be said for an anti-inflammatory diet, but I don't know that that's working at the level of microbiome. Well, it, it probably is though, Jack, it looks like from metabolomics that it's, you know, uh, changing the array of short chain fatty acids, uh, which comes as a result of some anti-inflammatory diets, which then the change in that is mediated by the gut microbiome. So there's a lot there, but there's a lot of moving parts, no pun intended. Uh, you know, there's the, the bugs and the products of the bugs and how the bugs interact and the intestinal epithelial barrier. But, you know, Jack, you said this has been for eight years, but remember when we were at UT Southwestern in the 80s, Joel Torog showed that in his B27 transgenic rat, that if, they, if you grew them, my, if you grew them sterile, they had no they microbiome and they had no disease. Right. I mean, we should have known something back then. Um, I mean, everybody went, wow. And then didn't do <laughs> much with it for another 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I would point to in my skepticism, which is really newfound, I must say, um, you know, we know a lot about the dentition and the, you know, and all that. Yet there's been no interventions that show that, you know, fixing periodontal disease in many different ways let leads to lessening of RA activity. So, um, um, but uh, anyway, I think we need to move on. Any, any final comments, David, you had, what, what's your takeaway on this? Well, I mean, obviously you know, everything that's been said, and I think we all work in this with a appropriate level of cynicism, but yet it's still an appealing idea. We haven't even talked about where in the disease process this, um, you know, should occur, where it have its best effect. And it just seems like we need to go back to the drawing board, find out more from uh, from uh, translational um, uh, studies and really try and think about what we're actually delivering to patients. So I've really enjoyed this conversation, hearing some insights. Okay. All right. Much to be learned still. Um, we're going to move on to the second paper, which is um, an interesting head-to-head -head trial of ixacizumab versus adalimumab in active psoriatic arthritis patients who have a smidgen of active skin disease. Um, these patients were biologic naive and the results of this trial were previously published as this was a 26, 24 week primary endpoint. This is the complete data set at going out to week 52 is published in Annals of Rheumatic Disease with Joe Smolin as the um, lead author, uh, author and Peter Nash uh, as a secondary. So what we do know is that um, there are few head-to-head uh, -head trials. We actually did review one two weeks ago. Um, and um, this is maybe uh, this, uh, maybe the second or third that's out there. And the question is, you know, are, are they going to have the same effect in uh, rheumatology as they've had in dermatology? There is a, a plethora of head-to-head -head trials in dermatology that has shown the superiority of some of the newer therapies over the, some of the conventional therapies. And this clearly seems to have a big impact on the prescribing behaviors of the dermatologists that they actually look at that data and say, well, this tells me what I'm going to do going forward. 
Um, I, I don't know if there's anybody relying anymore on etanercept to treat um, psoriasis. Uh, um, um, and if they are, they're probably the people who, you know, are stuck in the mud and did the original trials. Um, Spirit Head to Head is um, a 52-week trial. It had a 24-week primary endpoint of standard doses of ICSI versus adalimumab. Um, oh, forget about the interventions. That's wrong. I didn't kick that out. Um, they, this is 566 patients, and the primary endpoint was a co-primary endpoint of achieving both an ACR50 response and a POSSE100 response at week 24. Um, they use, and that was a superior, so this was a, a superiority endpoint. They use non-inferiority for ACR50 and superiority for a POSSE100, also week 24, as a secondary endpoint. And they had a bunch of other secondary endpoints, including ACR20, 50, 70, POSSE, 75, 90, 100, uh, HAC, DI, DLQI, enthesitis, and dactylitis scores. Um, so they, uh, again, this is similar to a lot of other trials, but again, I'll remind you one thing that, that these are biologic naive people. Um, so they had to be adults. They had to have um, um, meet CASPAR criteria to be enrolled and have three out of 68 small and tender joints. Um, they had to have failed one prior DMARD, conventional DMARD, um, but not yet have received a, a, a biologic. Um, and they had to have skin disease that was at a BSA of 3% or more. There were a few, I think it was like six people got in with that, below that number. And I guess they went in front of the judge and were, were acquitted or something. And so they were, in, they were enrolled. Uh, you could have been on background um, DMAR use. And you can see on the, on the right that the concomitant conventional DMAR use is 68 and 70%. In the two treatment groups It's pretty high compared to a lot of other trials I think that I've seen, but I wonder if Artie and, and Eric agree with that. Um, and this excluded, the, these numbers are, <laughs> are, are holdovers from the, the last slide. So forget about the rest of this. Um, but the top part, in fact, is right. So on the right, you're looking at the age. These are 40 to 50 year old people, mostly white people. Disease duration is 16, 15 years for psoriasis, six years or so for the PSA. A high number, mostly methotrexate. Um, they got in with 20 tender joints and 10 swollen joints. So this is not mild stuff. They have fairly, um, you know, uh, elevated, not high, uh, but still, nonetheless elevated mean uh, CRP levels here are high and their, uh, the number of their spark enthesitis index is reasonable to be a high number, about 60 plus percent actually had evidence of enthesitis uh, in this trial by either le of the uh, leads. Um, index or the spark index. Um, so uh, I want to ask, um, Eric, what do you think of the co-primary endpoints? Is that a game we're playing here? Or is that, I mean, I'm, if I'm a patient, that's meaningful, right? I do want my skin and my joints to get miraculously better. But, you know, when you have a drug that's, you know, an IL-17 or an IL-23 inhibitor, you know it's going to work better at skin. Um, and when you make it the co-primary endpoint, are you not stacking the deck? You're, you're on um, a mute, Eric. Sorry, sorry, the dog barked and I put on mute. Um, yeah, 100%. I mean, I, I don't know that it's a game, but if you're going to invest a lot of money in this trial, I mean, this is not an inexpensive trial to do, following people out a year on, you know, 560-some people on two drugs, you want to make sure the trial succeeds, right? And, you know, Part of the reason the dermatologists have done a lot of head-to-heads is that their primary data it sort of suggests already that certain biologics work better than others for treating skin disease. We don't have that in, in joint disease, right? We don't have any, even just looking across studies, there's not even a suggestion that there should be a difference. So when they set this up, if you're going to invest all the time and effort and money into doing this trial, you want to pick an endpoint that's likely to show that your drug, which in this case is ixekizumab because it's sponsored by Lilly, is going to be better. And so you're going to want a skin endpoint. I mean, you know, if you did a trial with adalimumab and looked at PASI 100 as a primary endpoint, you'd be like, that, that's foolish. That's not going to happen because we never thought that adalimumab was that good for skin disease. So um, it does stack the deck. I, it's a meaningful endpoint. I mean, there's no question about it that people whose joints and skin are really both much better. That's an important thing but it's really set up to show 
you know, that, that at a limit, I was just not going to, not going to do the job in this trial. Already, yeah. It was, I mean, it, yeah, I agree with what, what Eric said. Um, and had it been set up otherwise with the primary endpoint being the PASI 100 or, or the PASI 75 uh, or the ACR or whatever, you would look at all the outcomes anyway. At least the yeah. PSA geeks uh, among us would look at all the outcomes. And this shows you exactly what you expect. So, yes, uh, the combined endpoint one driven 100% by the skin. So, uh, you, you know, in, in that way, it was a little bit biased. If you look at the secukinumab data in their exceed study and you look at it this way, exactly the same. You beat yeah. them on the skin, uh, tied them with the joints, uh, almost beat them with the joints. And, um, you know, yeah, this it is better on the skin, but still, it's great to have the head to head. So I want to ask the question. I keep asking this question and, and maybe um, one of you can enlighten me, but ACR 205070, it has a clear cut ceiling effect. As Eric said, everybody gets the same responses no matter what. You know, it's just and, and minute differences and the differences are, best, are based on how treated you were before you went into the trial. So it's a 60, 40, 20 if you're basically methotrexate non-responder and you get into some intervention, that's what it, so there's a ceiling effect. And I, I and, and we know how ACR 2050, 70 was, de was designed. ACR 20 was designed to give you spread between the real drug and the placebo, as far as an actual treatment effect. We had the same ceiling effect on posse 75, 50s for a long time. Yep. And then the roof got blown up by new molecules. Right. So, um, were Posse 75, I, I always thought that that was designed the same way as the ACR20 was, was to give you a spread between drug effect and, and the placebo background. Not with I as much this... data. No, it was just sort of picked in discussions with the agency. Um, they, As far as I know, maybe Eric can tell me if I'm wrong, they didn't do what the creators of the DAS did, nor what uh, the creators of the ACR20 did to separate it out. They just said this is going to be, this is a, a very meaningful bar. Patients can absolutely positively detect a PASI 50 um, improvement. You know, they are better, absolutely positively. So the PASI 75 was really, I think, came from discussions with the agency. But I think in the end, though, it's um, e either that it's a better measure, right? So that there's no ceiling effect, like we see with the ACR response, or or it's biology. You know, my my takeaway is if we had an IL twenty three for psoriatic arthritis or an IL twenty three like drug, a drug that worked like that works on skin for psoriatic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, we would be seeing ACR seventies of 60 percent, and we just aren't. I'm not 100. I'm not sure that that's all just the measure. I think there's a biologic basis here, and that these these cytokine targets are just for whatever you know. For in terms of what's going on in the skin, they are clearly more effective than the than the targets that were tried before, and so you can quibble. But I my suspicion is that we just haven't found a better target in in the joint disease yet. Some of it's measurement. Some of it is you, there's only so far you can go because there's so many pieces to the ACR response. But I think some of it's really biology. I, I believe that to be true as well. Um, so this is what, uh, where you're going to see the uh, primary endpoint is in the top left here. This is the combined ACR50 and POSI100 where you're seeing separation as early as eight weeks. Um, and obviously at the primary endpoint, this was uh, a very significant at 0.001 and then it remains significant out to week 52. Um, on the, uh, staying on the top, we're looking at skin, posse 100, clear cut separation, posse 75, um, higher numbers and maybe a little less separation, but still significant um, between the ixekizumab, which is in orange and the adalimumab, which is in purple. And then on the bottom, you're looking at joint responses, ACR50, the co-primary endpoint on the bottom, and then ACR20 and ACR70. And they're neck and neck, you know, as far as uh, the arthritis goes of active PSA. And these were very active. Remember, 20 tender, um, 10 swollen, high CRPs. Um, you know, these numbers are, are 
this is encouraging that they both go because there is, you know, some opinion that some of these um, drugs, the, the, the psoriasis friendly drugs may not be so great on the, on the joints. And this, I think, argues against that. Um, so again, this was very significant on the combined endpoint, but again, when it comes to the ACR 50, about a 50% response for both drugs and then the so equivalent responses for the ACR 20, 50, 70, uh, and also enthesitis and dactylitis, which I don't think I'm going to show you, um, um, going out to again, fully to 52 weeks. Um, does this, this doesn't tell us anything we didn't already know. I, you know what, if I look at this, I, uh, if I'm a payer and it's next year and we have generic adalimumab, I'm saying past the 100 of 41% looks pretty damn good. So, um, you know, how much how much more is it worth uh, to, to get 60% out of the box compared to 40% when we're talking past the 100? Um, I, you know, that's that the, they're not shabby results for, for either drug. Both look good. And you're right. Both look equally good for the skin. I mean, for the joints. Excuse the joints me. Yeah. The joints. Jack, I um, think the important thing though, is that um, there is value to the study because um, this is something we suspected, but not something we already knew, right? We, we, we suspected that an IL-17 inhibitor would be as good as a TNF inhibitor for joint disease. And this trial plus the EXCEED trial with secukinumab, I think confirmed that in, in, a, in a, you know, a true head-to-head -head trial where you're comparing them in the same study. You know, and, and you mentioned like newer drugs, are they gonna be as good? And I think everybody has their suspicions about the IL-23 inhibitors, which are great for skin. Are they gonna be as good for joints as the other biologics you already used? And we don't really know. And, and I think it would be fabulous to have a head to head with one of those drugs to sort of answer this same question. Does it make the same difference for joints? As a rheumatologist, when you're picking a treatment for your patient, that's the question you really want to know the answer to. Yeah. You know, uh, Artie's point about, you know, posse 100 of, uh, you know, of uh, where was the posse 100 over here of, you know, 63% you know, is just gigantically, I mean, you know, surprising. And even this is not too bad, but there's a clear difference here. I think you can use this data when you're trying to use those very difficult patients where you're going to use combination biologics. I'd use this data to say, well, this is why I got to use, an, you know, the IL-17 inhibitor because these tremendous responses, they could also turn around and say, well, for the, at least for the joints, they're the same and one drug should work equally well, but the skin is different. And you may have to choose another biologic or another expensive therapy to better control the arthritis. And I, that's that that's the tact I've I've been able to use when trying to get, you know, two expensive therapies approved for what is clearly, you know, off-label use in very difficult or refractory patients. Um, and Evan Leibowitz in in New Jersey asked, could the part could part of the problem be that we're treating the joints later than um, then maybe earlier, which might be more optimal. Optimal. We need to deal with central sensitization. That's another issue that, that's not really being addressed here. But uh, you know the time frame. You know, I mean, I think that these uh, patients are earlier by virtue of not having been exposed to biologics, but still they had six years of psoriasis. So I don't think that's early disease in anyone's book um, going forward. So. Um, Next was um, the issue of whether they should be on background DMARDs. We said that 60% were on background DMARDs. And on the top, you're looking at ACR50 responses. This is the group over here that has no background DMARDs, methotrexate, leflunomide, cyclosporin, and sulfasalazine. Uh, and, on the, and most of it's methotrexate, by the way. And on the right, they are on methotrexate, sulfasalazine, whatever. And, you know, it doesn't look like there's a big difference there. There's not, it doesn't look like there's a gigantic augmentation. You know, the, the, at week 40, this is 59. Over here at week 30 and 50, is about 50. In the end, this ends up at 53. This is 51. I don't know. And then on the bottom, you're looking at posse 100 responses. Um, and is there a difference here? The bottom line is, I, I don't know. Um, Eric, did you, do you have a, a view on this? Yeah, I, I think these are hard. This is the same question that's come up with all the biologic trials in PSA, because this is not 
adding concomitant DMARD at the same time you do the biologic. These people came in with active disease despite the methotrexate or the leflunomide or whatever the heck they were taking, which says it wasn't really working very well, right? It was, it was maybe doing something, but it clearly wasn't doing enough because they had 20 swollen joints despite what they were taking. So I, 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 I don't know how much you take away from the, the, you know, the importance of concomitant DMARDs in, in these kind of trials when you're not sort of looking at a true combination study where you put them on either one or both right out of the gate. Um, so maybe there's something here, but I, I just, I, it's always hard to interpret what you're getting out of the concomitant therapy in these kind of, in, in these the trial designs where they come in on it. Hardy? Yeah, absolutely true. And I think the top, the joint responses would say exactly that, you know, as we, you always say, well, maybe they just started taking their methotrexate every week, as opposed to, you know, what they, you know, sometimes people don't take it. But the bottom line, I think is very interesting. I think this says, you know, if you look at the adalimumab, you get much, I think you get a much better response if you're on the methotrexate. And I would take this to the clinic and say, if I have two patients, PSA, if they're on methotrexate, and they're going to go on the TNF inhibitor, I would say, you know what, let's try to keep on a little bit of methotrexate. I think it's going to be better. If they're going to the IL-17, I would have no problem at all saying, you know what, once let's get you on treatment. When it's done, when it's done, let's get rid of the methotrexate because I'm not sure that it's really helping much. Um, sure. I, I mean, this data doesn't show that, but it kind of points toward yeah. that, which, um, you know, and we know the synergy in RA between the methotrexate and TNF inhibitor. This says, I mean, at least for the skin, you, you don't need that maybe for the IL-17 inhibition because those curves, the two orange curves at the bottom sure look very similar, whereas the, the purple ones definitely look better with the methotrexate. Absolutely. I agree with that. Artie, Art, you're an immunologist. Do you think that this is the immunogenicity story, that, that there's more antigenic response to when you get an IL, a TNF inhibitor than with the IL-17 inhibitors. We certainly see a lot more anti-drug antibodies to the TNF inhibitors than the IL-17 inhibitors, and, and maybe methotrexate plays a role in, in reducing that. Um, you, you, that could certainly be playing a role, but remember, and again, not in PSA, but in RA, you get about a 25% area under the curve increase in your uh, galimumab, infliximab, which was first demonstrated, and adalimumab when you're on methotrexate. And that happens really quickly. So is it, you know, I've seen things where maybe it is uh, FC gamma uh, alteration by methotrexate because, we, you know, how many other things methotrexate does that we don't know? I don't know that we know about. The immunogenicity could be part, but I sure expect that to be later on than right after, right after they started. So, but I, you know, it's funny because I don't know the data um, for the IL-17s as well. Uh, maybe somebody who's watching knows that data. Is there any PKPD interaction with uh, methotrexate? There's not with the Tanercept. There are with the, uh, like I said, the monoclonal antibody TNFs. I don't know for the IL-17s if the, uh, that data must be there. I should actually know that. Enough. All right. So um, th I think that was going to answer the question about whether or not we need concomitant therapy, mainly just in skin and only without a limb map. Safety signals, there were no deaths, but and, and none of these results, by the way, are significant, but they're numerically somewhat different responses. So overall adverse events, treatment emergent adverse events, it was a little bit higher, 74 versus 69 percent. Eh. Fewer severe adverse, uh, as judged by the investigator, with uh, ixekizumab, 3.2 versus 7.1. Fewer SAEs, uh, regulatory definition of a serious adverse event. Um, that's different than severe, T-E-A-E, -E, um, but it's 4 versus 12%. Uh, and then um, serious infection is a little bit lower with ixekizumab, 1.8 versus 2.8. And candida, a little bit higher, 2.5 versus 1.1. Eric, are these meaningful? I mean, they're low-level numbers and they're numerically different, but they're certainly not, none of these are statistically significant. Well, I mean, I, I think they're meaningful only to the point that it does suggest that there's a difference, which sort of fits with the data that we've seen. And it would say, you know, if you've got a patient with PSA starting on a first biologic, you know, what do you take away from this study? You start them on ixekizumab, an IL-17 inhibitor, in this case, ixekizumab, they're going to get just as good a joint response. They may get a better skin response. And the safety is, if anything, a little bit better. So, you know, from a strictly sort of 
medical standpoint on what's the drug that's going to work best for that patient, you could argue that the, the, the takeaway from this study is why not give them an IL-17? Now, to already, the point already made earlier, that's all going to be challenged next year when we have a biosimilar for adalimumab. Is that enough of a difference to counterbalance the cost differential? And that's all going to be very dependent on what the cost difference is for the patient. But it, it, absent cost, I, you could take away from the study. It says, well, why not? What's the da- you know what's the downside to starting them on an IL seventeen and it's their first biologic and not a TNF inhibitor? Yeah, I agree, and and I think um, and I, I've, I I'm thinking of one particular patient with uh, brand new and, and had never been on anything and liver dysfunction, history of TB, serious infections. And I, I was like, you know, I, I want to give her, you know, an IL-17 or an IL-23 as the first because the serious infections, if they're, and there's some, some registry data that says that maybe you do get fewer serious infections than the TNF inhibitors. Not that it's a lot with the TNF inhibitors, but since we can't predict serious infections and since serious infection is the best predictor of serious infection in the future, <laughs> um, or, you know, your, your diabetic patient on steroids for other reason. I think that's a great argument. And, and um, you know, these data then go with these other data, the registry data and other, you know, the, and data would say that 17s uh, may be better for that signal, the serious infectious events. So um, not part of this study, but how do um, our panelists feel about the different IL-17 inhibitors, you know, ixekizumab versus secukinumab versus pedalumab? You know, um, I think most of us are locked into using one and we pretty much use that one um, as opposed to doing a lot of, you know, random use of these drugs. I, I personally haven't used much for dalumab at all. Um, um, and I use a lot of secukinumab and then I've gone to a lot of ixetizumab. Do, do, how do you guys deal with this issue of which one do, you, you should be using? Um, is it random? Well, Unfortunately, I think it's very, very unscientific and unmedical. When you write a prescription and it comes back and says, what you should do is try this one. And yeah. you know, for years, secukinumab was always the first. And now I, for a lot of the payers, now it's ixekizumab. And the data are great for both. And so I have a hard time really saying you know, to the patient because it's them paying the different copay. You know? um, so it's driven a lot by the access. Yeah, I would agree. I don't. I don't think, from a joint perspective, there's enough difference to make a, a meaningful choice. The dermatologists seem to think that ixekizumab is a little bit better for skin, but I'm not sure that I know enough of the data to say that's true or not. Um, you know, the big difference to date has been that the ixekizumab shots hurt more, and but that may change come later this year when they have the new formulation that's a citrate free, like they did with adalimumab a couple of years ago. Um, and, and like you, Jack, I have very little bordalumab experience. We started to do some of the clinical trials back in the day, but then it got right. canned. And so I just, I don't have any feel for it. You know, the big question I think later this year will be bemakizumab, which is an IL-17 inhibitor that inhibits two different f- versions of IL-17, IL-17 A and F, which the dermatologists think is going to be a big win for skin disease. I don't think we know yet whether that's going to make any difference at all for the joint disease. Right. Just need to watch for a candida there, but it looks like mostly mucus yeah. oral candidiasis there. But yeah, I've never found that to be a huge issue with any of these. It's right. it's either oral, sometimes it's vaginal candidiasis, and it and it's not a deal breaker because it responds to fluconazole, and it's you know it it's I don't think that's as concerning as a serious you know bacterial infection. So to um, to wrap up um, again, the data we is it is there. There's nothing surprising that conclusion. Um, I guess my question to all of you are, or do head to head trials change the way you practice? Um, I, I yell at rheumatologists to say it hasn't changed the way you practice at all. We got three or four in RA and I don't think it changed therapy at all. Um, but in dermatology, it looks like it's been really important in changing the, the, the actually use profile. So, um, I, I don't know that it's changed, but I think the potential for change is that I bet before spirit head to head and before exceed, if you asked a hundred rheumatologists, which is better for the joints, TNF or IL-17, 99 would have said TNF. 
But now we have the data and you can't really say that anymore. Maybe it's faster. Doesn't look like that either. Maybe as Jack always says, the, Oh my God, 20, where you get a central nervous system effect of the TNF inhibition. Maybe that's different. But when you look at the data, um, I think you, you can't help but say that they they're just as effective for the joints and, and the antheses and the dactylitis as well and better on the skin. And, and, you know, to be fair, Jack, the head-to-heads that we've had both here and in RA and in rheumatology have not shown dramatic differences between the two drugs that are being compared. It's a kind of a different story than in dermatology, where many of the head-to-heads they've done have really shown that one drug is clearly superior to the other in terms of response rates. So that's going to change treatment paradigms much more so than a drug, you know, than a trial that shows that they're either comparable or one's a little bit better. Um, it's not going to move the needle in terms of making you use that more. Yeah, we unfortunately we have those trials where one's better efficacy wise, but the other one's better safety wise. Safety. And like, right. uh, what, so what do I take away what from do you do that? With that? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think this does answer the question: which drug to use when um, in, in PSA when the skin is involved? I think that this does really um, help that, and I think that the, we kind of figured out where we. You should stay on background DMARDs, but other other than um, sticking with adalimumab, um, maybe you don't need to be on background DMARDs. But then again, that's not really the same as the trial that would start them and randomize right. them into those, right? Because Eric, right. I, I remember seeing a, a slides that you made where um, having background DMARD was beneficial in SPA, in spondyloarthritis, as far as uh, some responses. But not, not always consistent. So I, I, right. I, I think most of us are on the side of continuing, but what's, what's your guidance for people about in PSA specifically, should they continue background DMARDs? I mean, I obviously continue when you start the biologic because you don't want to take, you know, you don't want to take away something that may be doing some good for them. Um, you know, already said this already. I think that if it's a if it's an IL-17 inhibitor, I'm more inclined to just drop the methotrexate altogether. In many of my patients who are on um, adalimumab with methotrexate, I'm kind of inclined to leave them on five or seven and a half or 10 milligrams a week just because they're doing well. That's not a particularly you know, unsafe added drug to have on board. And if it helps them maintain response, I, I'd rather do that. Okay. Um, any final comments on this particular paper? I think it was a, a good paper, one good to certainly review. Um, next week, we're going to have um, another Tuesday night rheumatology, but we're going to start to roll out Room Now Live content. Um, and next week is about rheumatoid arthritis. And the very first pod that we presented in Room Now Live 2022, um, you'll be seeing excerpts from my lecture on refractory RA on Caleb Michaud's um, excellent talk on adherence to therapies and resistance to change in therapies. And then uh, Ernie Choi talking about precision medicine in RA. So we'll do that, um, look at uh, some video clips and have a, a discussion next week. And we're gonna be keep doing um, uh, these Tuesday night rheumatologies all the way into June and then we'll take the summer off. So another month of Tuesday night rheumatology for those of you who are interested. I wanna thank the panel for their participation um, in the program. Uh, I want to thank the audience for tuning in. I tell your folks that, um, that we not only are getting you to attend by um, having you participate in, in the live webinar, but you could actually watch our live stream on YouTube, on Twitter, um, and soon on other channels and maybe even the Room Now website. So we're live streaming to um, our social channels as well. So that's kind of a cool new thing. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Good job, David. Uh, Jack, um, now oh, that Elon oh. bought it, can you can you give me a, a, a Twitter tutorial? Because I think I might have to do it now. <laughs> you have a very successful Twitter um, uh, account in RWCS MTG, RWCS Meeting, which tons of people follow and you put out good content. So I assume that you're not the one tweeting then. <laughs> uh, see, these are, the, these are the kind of things I need to learn. <laughs> talk, talk to your children is all I can tell you. <laughs> all right, everyone. Good night. All the best. Thanks all. Lots of fun. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.